I, I can't, I can't, I'm sorry. I just can't, I just can't do it anymore. I cannot take it. This guy, Gordon Freeman, regularly makes every list of the greatest video game characters of all time, and I don't understand why. I can't possibly be the only person in this room who every time he picks up a controller thinks that there is something wrong with him. It's just, walking around, picking up ammo and health packs, and people are trying to tell him important things? <sighs> Before I go on, I have been asked to remind everyone to turn off their cell phones and to please fill out your evaluations after the session, unless, of course, you work for Valve, in which case maybe that just got a little awkward. All right, where was I? All right, I was making fun of this guy. But this problem, this Gordon Freeman problem, is, to my mind, just one manifestation of a common problem in video games today, and that is weak character work. Right? Now, character is hard, and it's hard in any medium. And it's particularly hard in games, which have some unique requirements for doing a good job of establishing character. Right? First and foremost, in games, the audience is expected to become the character. We are one of the characters. It's not enough to have empathy or sympathy with the characters. We actually have to have a sense of oneness, a sense of unity between the two. And secondly, there are so many different types of games, so many different subgenres, and almost every one of them has its own peculiar, particular requirements for establishing characters. I mean, linear games, right, fully scripted narratives, these have completely different requirements from open world sandbox games where anything can happen. And on top of the different types of games, we have different ways of presenting characters within those games. We have the silent characters, right? The ones who have no voice. We have the cinematic characters, the ones who are fully scripted. We have the open characters, the ones where we let the players choose who they are. And most games, I think, fit within these broad categories. They're spectrums, right? So there's some hybrids that fall in between. You have game like, a game like Halo, where your character speaks, but he doesn't really say anything. And then you've got games like Mass Effect, right, where there's lots of player choice, but it's still heavily scripted. So many different types of games out there with so many different demands. Is it even conceivable that there could be some kind of grand unified theory of character in games that applies to all of them? Well, as it happens, I think there is. And over the next 45 minutes, I'd like to tell you all about it. But first... I'd like to talk about myself. My name is Jeremy Bernstein. I am a hyphenate writer and game designer. I have designed games about everything from Ben 10 to congressional redistricting. Super sexy. And I've written games on everything from uh, Dead Space 2 to Pretty in Pink. I've also recently been working in Hollywood as a television writer for the hit series Leverage. Now, I've gone and used a dirty word just there. Hollywood writers are not usually very well thought of in the video game industry. It's generally perceived that they don't understand the specifics of games as a medium, the things that make them different from film or television. And in general, I believe that's true. However, as someone who's worked on both sides of that particular divide, I also believe that sometimes we in the games industry have a tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to the ideas that come out of Hollywood. Because despite the problems, these ideas are grounded in 3,000 years' worth of fundamental human storytelling traditions. And whether you're talking about Oedipus Rex or Walter White, it all kind of works the same. So maybe, just maybe, there's something that we can mine out of these ideas that will give us some insight into this guy. Now, before I go any further, a disclaimer. Every game that I talk about today is a game that I love. Games that I don't love, I left out of the talk. Now, as you may have noticed, I am going to be, from time to time, speaking critically about some of these games, particularly about certain elements of character, right? But these are bits, these are pieces, these are moments that don't work for me. And I find deconstructing those moments to find out why they don't work to be extremely instructive. But every game I talk about, is a game that I love. Are we clear? All right. Let's start off with a question then. Why bother? Why characters? Why are characters important in games? Are characters even important in games? Tetris didn't need characters. 
Well, the answer, of course, is no, we don't need characters. What we need in games is avatars. We need something that we can control. And this is one of the first pitfalls that we run into when we're talking about character in games, is confusing character and avatar. For example, I think most people would say that Pac-Man is one of the most popular video game characters of all time. But really, when push comes to shove, Pac-Man is not all that different from this. He's an avatar, not a character. And if I were looking to start a fight, which it's just possible that I am, I might argue that the original incarnations of these two guys are really, basically, just Tetris blocks. So what's the difference between character and avatar? Well, the difference is context. Avatars give a game mechanical context. I mean, when you think about it, games are really just systems of numbers. What is Space Invaders other than some vector calculations, three hit point reservoirs, and collision detection? But nobody wants to play that. So we create an avatar to make some sense of it. It's a way to create engagement with the players that the sheer system that the math wouldn't have. So avatars provide a mechanical context, but characters, characters provide emotional context. And this is important because we are emotional beings. Characters engage us. Emotions engage us. And if you want proof, look no further than this game. Now, if you played this game and you didn't have an emotional experience, I don't think you're fully human. <laughs> but it was because of the character work, not because of the gameplay. There's barely any gameplay. In fact, there's a whole talk this morning on whether or not this is actually a game. And by the way, if this isn't a game, then I don't want to be a gamer. But more than that, there's even data that suggests that characters are more engaging in games to players than narrative is. If anyone was at the Game Narrative Summit earlier this week, there was a presentation from Deborah Henderson, a user researcher at Microsoft, about measuring player engagement in games. And one of her key findings was that game characters were more memorable to players than the plot. So to those who ask why character, I would respond, in short, because science says it will make people like your game more. I'm paraphrasing Dr. Henderson slightly there. So character, where do we start? Well, as with all good things, let us start with a definition. What exactly is character? Well, broadly speaking, I would say the people in the story. I bet everyone is feeling really good about paying for those badges right about now. <laughs> but I bring this up for a reason, right? Because character are the people in the story. So in order to understand the definition of character, we first need to understand the definition of story. Now, whenever somebody at a games conference gives a talk about story, someone in the audience inevitably asks this question. Story and games, must we? And like character, no, of course we don't need stories. But we want stories. We like stories. We crave stories. Human beings apply storytelling to every form of art that we have invented. Music doesn't need story, but we create opera. Paintings are perfectly happy to be landscapes or portraits, but we're not happy with that. So no, we don't need stories in our games. But damn it, if we're going to have stories in our games, let's do them right. And good stories require good characters. Not just for all of the reasons I'm about to explain, but also because science. <laughs> all right, so back to our definition of story. If you've ever heard me talk before, then you know the definition of story that I subscribe to, and that is this. Someone who wants something badly and is having a hard time getting it. And the reason that I like this definition so much, particularly for games, is that it splits stories into two fundamental elements. Objectives and obstacles. And these are terms that we're used to thinking about when we think about games. Objectives are so important, we put them right up front on the HUD. An obstacle, well, that's just another word for gameplay. And right here is why good story requires good character. All stories start with someone. This someone is our character. We generally call them our protagonist. The protagonist has an objective, something that they want badly. 
In between the character and their want, there are a series of obstacles. The character proceeds forward, pursuing their want, overcoming the obstacles, till they reach their objective, and the story ends. That, in a nutshell, is every story. So, if this is our definition of story, someone who wants something badly and is having a hard time getting it, then our definition of character must logically be someone who wants something badly. Someone who wants something badly. <laughs> and by the way, this isn't just a good definition for a protagonist. Ideally, this is a definition for all of your characters. All the characters in your story want something. The antagonist wants something, and whatever that something is, it is that which creates the obstacles that our hero must face. The love interest wants something. Presumably, what they want is the protagonist. Every character, every sidekick, every quest digger, every mook, every random NPC, every character in your story should be someone who wants something badly. And that's one of the reasons why I think the story in this game is so effective. All the major characters in Uncharted 2 have a strong want. And more than that, these wants are almost always in direct competition with each other, if not mutually exclusive from each other. Let's start with Drake. Now, Drake actually has multiple wants in this game. First and foremost, he wants a treasure, a want in which he is opposed by the antagonist, Lazarevic, who also wants a treasure. Well, they can't both have it, So right there, our wants lock us into conflict. Now, Nate also wants revenge on Flynn for double-crossing him, and this is a want that Flynn understandably opposes. And by the way, Flynn also wants a treasure, right? So there's another angle to that particular conflict. Romantically, Nate wants a relationship with Elena or possibly also a relationship with Chloe. The two of them both want a relationship with him, which, outside the realm of fan fiction, are mutually exclusive wants. And by the way, Chloe also wants the treasure. So she is part of that whole mess as well. So you have all these different characters, all with their conflicting objectives, all with their diametrically opposed wants, all bouncing off of each other to make life difficult for our hero, for the player. And that is why a good story requires good character, because opposing wants create conflict. And conflict is not just drama. Conflict is gameplay. So this is how we define character, someone who wants something badly. All right, now how do we create character? Well, character has three elements. And the first most fundamental of those is this. What do they want? Which makes sense, right? This is our definition of character. It seems like a good place to start when we start thinking about character. And the best part is that thinking about this first want, excuse me, this first element, leads us directly to our second element. And that element is action. What do they do to get what they want? Our protagonist has an objective. They're opposed by obstacles. They progress towards their objective, overcoming those obstacles through action. And the actions that they take, the things that they do to get what they want, those tell us who that person truly is. If the want is the definition of a character, then the action they take in pursuit of that want is what defines them as a character. Hamlet wants to avenge his father. What does he do? He dithers. And that dithering is what defines him. Luke Skywalker wants to avenge his father What does uh, and fight the Empire, right? What does he do? He becomes a Jedi like his father, maybe a bit too much like his father, and that is the emotional conflict of this movie. Batman wants to avenge his parents. What does he do? He wages a never-ending crusade against crime. <laughs> And we've heard this before, right? That character is action. It's an old chestnut. But I think it's particularly applicable for games. Why? Well, because if character is action, and action is gameplay, well then, character is gameplay. And oh my god, is that not the best definition for character in video games of all time? And by the way, that's one of my problems with Gordon Freeman. What is Gordon's overriding action? 
What is the thing that Gordon Freeman, hero of the resistance, does in every level, the thing that he does time and time and time again? What Gordon does is what other people tell him to do. So what does that define Gordon's main quality as? Obedience. Yeah, there's a hero I want to be. Now, I pick on Gordon, but this is certainly not a problem that's unique to Gordon. It happens with a lot of silent heroes. It happened in Dead Space 1. In fact, I used to refer to this specifically as the Isaac fetch my slippers problem. And I think it's one of the things that makes players disengage from story in games. This is the opposite of what we're trying to do with character. It's the opposite of engagement. It always makes me think of that old Far Side cartoon, right? What dog, what we say to dogs, what dogs here, blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 blah. Well, come on. All right. So our first two elements of character. What does the character want? What do they do to get what they want? And the third element is all the things I haven't talked about yet, which is to say all of the things that we usually think of when we think about character. We think about what they look like. We think about where they live, how they grew up, who their family is, what their job is, their class, all of that stuff. This isn't character. It is an element of character. And that element is characterization. Who a character seems to be, what their traits are, how you would describe them, not define them, but describe them. And the thing that's important about characterization is that characterization is external. It is the outward appearance that forms a shell around the character. And if you want to know who a character really is, you need to get past that shell. You need to get to what's inside. Well, we can't see what's inside. Uh, in some games we can, but what's inside the character is their want. That comes from within. And want leads to action. And action is external. So action becomes a window that lets us see past the characterization into the heart, into the core of who that character really is. And that's why when you put these three elements together, you get a fully developed character, who they seem to be outside, who they really are inside, and how we can compare the two. All right, that's all well and good, but does any of it actually apply to games? Well, I think it does. Because when we take a look back at all those different types of games that we looked at before, what we find is that not only do these three elements of character apply to games, they're also explanatory towards games. What differentiates these types of games from each other is who gets to decide those elements of character, right? The difference between a linear game and a sandbox game is who makes the choice about what the player does. In a linear game, it's the designer. In a sandbox game, the player has that choice. What do I do to get what I want? Now, there's a spectrum there, to be sure, right? Many linear games are very wide railroads, and many sandboxes have tracks running straight down the middle. But by and large, the difference lies in who, who chooses and how much choice you give the player as to what they do. Similarly with the various character types, right? The difference between silent, cinematic, and open characters lies in who chooses their characterization. In cinematic characters, that choice is made by the designers. In open characters, that choice is made by the player. And silent protagonists, well, in those cases, no one chooses. Now, it's not as bad as that sounds, right? There's actually a very deliberate choice being made there. The choice being made there is to create a negative space that the player can then fill with whatever they read into it. And this can be extremely effective, once again, right? This is a silent protagonist, but she's negative space, by and large. We know a couple things about her, but she's far and away the least interesting person in this family from what we know in the game. But we're still on board with her. We're still, I at least, was supremely invested in her, but not because of her characterization, because of her want. She wants to find out what happened to her sister. And the character work they do with the sister, the way that they establish her, that makes me want to know what happened to her as well. There's the engagement 
because want is the central element of character. And this is another place where things get interesting. Because when we look at all these varying types of games with all their differences, the choice of want is almost always made by the designers. Now, sometimes you get a little bit of player choice of want, right? Mostly in open character games or sandbox games. But it's almost always at the low level. You don't get a choice in the high level wants in these sorts of things. In Fable, your high level want is established for you. You want to stop Lord Lucian. You want revenge for your sister. The low level wants, all of the things you want while you're on that quest, those are the things you get to make your choices about. Do you get married? Do you get a job? Are you going to be good? Are you going to be evil? Are you going to kick chickens? Right? That's the stuff that you get to choose. Now, what's also interesting is that there is, in fact, a whole class of games in which the players get to decide what they want. Games like Minecraft, games like The Sims. But what's particularly interesting is that in almost all of those games, you're not playing a character. You're playing a god, or you're playing an avatar. Generally not a character. So, because of that, they kind of fall outside the scope of a talk about character in games. But I thought it was worth mentioning, right, that this theory of three elements of character, it predicts there should be a whole range of games based around this, and sure enough, there they are. All right, moving on. These three elements, we can see that they apply very well to an understanding of how to treat character in all of the different subgenres of games. So clearly this theory is applicable. Now, what about the other difficulty that we run into with character in games that I mentioned before? This issue of unity between player and character. In linear media, we don't have to worry about this. We just need to get the audience on the character's side. But in games, we want to take those two separate entities and we want to make them one. We want to create unity between them. And this, of course, is why we get these negative space characters like Gordon. The idea is that anything that the character does that the player wouldn't do, anything he says, any opinion she expresses, any element of characterization that's opposed to the player will shatter that unity, and you end up with a non-immersive experience. Well, now we have a slightly different framework to use to think about unity. Because if there are three defining elements of characters, what they want, what they do, and how they seem, then creating unity between player and character means we need to accomplish three different things. We need to establish three different kinds of unity. Unity of trait, unity of action, and unity of purpose. And we need to talk about these three things each separately because they are not all created equal. What happens if we don't have unity of purpose? If I, as the player, can't get behind the want of the character, well, what happens in short is we have a problem, because I don't care. I don't care what they're going through, I don't care what they're doing, and that means I don't care about the story. I have no emotional context. And by and large, that means I quit. Right Now here's an example. I want to stress this is a personal story. In no way should anyone think this is a problem with a game. If anything, it's a compliment to the game, because it managed to get me role-playing so well, I screwed myself out of being able to play the game. The original Dragon Age. My character was a dwarven noble. And every time there was a choice that was smug or arrogant or superior, I went with that particular choice. As a result, the way I ended up role-playing this character was as a wildly racist dwarf who had nothing but contempt for all non-dwarves. To the point that when NPCs started saying to me, the bad guys are going to destroy the world, I actually found myself thinking, not the dwarven part. <laughs> I mean, you surface guys, you're pretty much screwed, but we're dwarves, bring them on. My want no longer aligned with the want that the game was pushing on me, and I couldn't play anymore. So I broke unity of purpose. I did that to myself. But nonetheless, it meant I had to stop playing a game I was enjoying because I just wasn't engaged. So unity of purpose, critical. Now what about unity of action? If we don't have unity of action, things get interesting. Because there's two different ways that a break in unity of action can play. The first way that it plays is that the player looks at it and says, 
That's not what I would do. Now, this is a problem, because basically this is a form of ludonarrative dissonance. The story and the system are at odds with each other, and the, uh, as a result, the play experience is broken, and I check out. And this, again, by the way, this is one of my big Gordon Freeman problems. Gordon and I do have unity of purpose, right? I'm down with getting rid of the combine. We're good there. But unity of action, that's where we have a problem. Because Gordon doesn't do what I would do. What would I do? I would answer people who talk to me. <laughs> These are scared, worried people who are excited to see you because you are their hero. And what does Gordon do? He gives them a cold shoulder. Unity of action is broken, and I'm out. And the problem here isn't the silence. It's not a silent protagonist thing. Because Gone Home works, and Portal works. Portal, Chell is my hands-down favorite silent protagonist of all time. But those games work because those characters don't have anyone to talk to. There's no violation of unity of action. Gone home, she's all alone. In Portal, GLaDOS is talking to you over the PA system, but she's not actually present. And by the time you are actually in the same room with her, there's really not that much left to say. <laughs> so unity of action is preserved in Portal. And there's a great controlled experiment for this, which is Portal 2. Wheatley and GLaDOS are both right there with you during a huge chunk of this game. And as much as I love it, as much as I love the gameplay, as much as I love the writing, am I the only one who really, at some point, wanted to say to GLaDOS, you know what? You're a French fry, and I have a portal gun. I'm going to take my chances. <laughs> but you can't. So Portal gives perfect unity of action. Challenge Portal 2, not as much. Now, I said there were two responses to a breakdown in unity of action. The first is I wouldn't, have do, I wouldn't do that. The second is I wouldn't do that, but my character would. And this one actually turns out to be OK. In fact, there's no better example of this in games than this guy, right? <laughs> Batman and I, we totally have unity of purpose. He wants to stop crime. I am good with that. Unity of action, do we have that? Well, what does Batman do to get what he wants? <laughs> now, none of these are things that I would do. But what's awesome about the game is that I get to be Batman. The fantasy is the attraction. So even if I wouldn't do it, he would. So hells yes, let's do it together. And that creates unity of action. But imagine for a moment, imagine that the Arkham games let you do this. Well, now we have a problem. Because killing people is not only something that I wouldn't do, it's something Batman wouldn't do. It's out of character, which breaks unity of action, and I quit. And some people have this response to the Uncharted games, right? As Nathan Drake, there are certain things that I expect to do. I expect to jump, I expect to climb, to sneak, to solve puzzles, to fight. What I don't expect to do as Nathan Drake is go on a murder spree. <laughs> now, personally, this didn't bother me, right? To me, it just read as an extension of the fighting. Body count, I didn't care. But I know that some people do. And I can see why. Because it's a break in unity of action. And again, it's just because that doesn't seem like something Nathan Drake would do, right? If I were playing a Gears of War game, then Murder Spree makes total sense. In fact, I'm not sure any other action makes sense in a Gears of War game. <laughs> All right. So, unity of purpose, critical. Unity of action, variable. Can be fatal if you break it, but it can also be a critical element of the fantasy to break it. So what about the last element, unity of trait? What happens if we don't have unity of trait? Well, as it turns out, not so much. 
unity of trait is kind of not that important. I mean, think about this insanely popular video game, Badass. Now, this may be the only game, the original Metroid, the only game I can think of that used a silent protagonist to establish unity of trait with the audience and then deliberately shattered unity of trait for half the audience. And minds were blown. And it's not like it hurt her popularity any. So it's okay if we don't get all the way to here, to unity of trait. It may even be okay if we don't get all the way to unity of action, as long as we get to unity of purpose. Because two people who aren't the same, who want the same things but aren't the same, do you know what we call them? We call them partners. And partners can work together very well. You don't have to be the same. You don't have to have the same worldview. You don't even have to like each other. If you want the same thing, you can work with them. But if we end up here, if we end up with two people who are the same, but who don't want the same thing, who have unity of trait, but not unity of purpose, you know what we call them? Them, we usually call enemies. This right here, this is the real silent character problem. When the push for unity of trait, the push of for seeming, comes at the cost of unity of purpose or unity of action. You don't need to make me be your character. I just need to want to work with them. So, these are our three unities of character shown by order of importance. Unity of trait, largely optional. Unity of purpose, important but fungible. Excuse me, unity of action, important but fungible. Unity of purpose, that one is critical. Okay, so if these elements are so important, right, let's get practical. How do we establish them? Well, there are a lot of different techniques that one can use to establish these various types of unity in games. Each subgenre, of course, has some of its own unique requirements, but I do think that there are some best practices that apply across all of them, right? So let's talk about unity of trait first. Now, I just said that you don't need it. But it's nice, right? It can create identification with a character. If it's open, it can create agency. It can create ownership for a character. And these are both forms of engagement. So if we can get there, it's nice. But if we can't, well, let's not break our backs. So how do we establish unity of trait? Well, let's look at each of our three different types of characters. For silent characters, we don't establish unity of trait. We establish nothing. That's what they're there for. For cinematic characters, we also don't establish unity of trait. We just let them be themselves, and we get to be their partners. Although, by the way, as long as we're on the topic, I'd just like to say that given that unity of trait isn't as important as everyone seems to think, maybe we could share it a little bit with people who don't look like this. All right. Our last type of character, open characters, right, where the player gets to decide who their character is. How do we establish unity of trait here? Well, that's pretty well a solved problem. So that's unity of trait. How about unity of action? Things get a little bit more interesting here. Our two different types of games that are differentiated by action, linear and sandbox, right? Both have very different requirements in this case. But in both cases, the easiest way to determine if what you're doing is going to help maintain unity of action is the same. It's ask yourself one simple question. What would I do? Does this action make sense to me or to my character given the situation. And once you've got unity of action, maintaining it, particularly in a sandbox game, it's usually pretty easy because we let the player choose what they want to do. If they don't think their character would do something, then they don't do it. The tricky bit here is just making sure you've got your bases covered enough, right, so that you've got most of the wants that people want. That's what playtesting is for. Now, in linear games, where the player doesn't get to choose, where the designer tells the player what it is that they're going to do, there are a couple of different techniques to use to establish unity here. First and foremost, and I cannot stress this enough, don't make them do anything that's stupid. And this is a real pitfall, particularly in games, right? Because sometimes somebody comes up with some really cool gameplay, but there's no narrative reason for it. So they just slap together some half-assed excuse, and you get a tortured story. 
Players look at this and think, wait, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? That's the opposite of engagement. Now, the other thing that you need to do to establish unity of action is that you need to make sure that you have already secured unity of purpose. Action comes out of want. And nine times out of ten, if you're violating unity of action, it is probably because the player isn't on board with the same want that you're pushing. Right? Now, this was something that happened to me in the original Dead Space. All right? And this game did a fantastic job of establishing want. I absolutely had unity of purpose. I wanted off that ship. <laughs> right? So I go to hell and back in order to try to fix a shuttlecraft so we can get the hell out of there. We had unity of action on that front, too. And then I meet this guy. This guy who's still alive on a ship full of people where everyone else who's still alive is entirely batshit crazy. And this guy says to me, you know, maybe, just maybe, I'm just throwing this out here, I know you fixed that shuttle because what you really want to do is get the hell out of here. But I was thinking that maybe instead of getting the hell out of here, what you could do is take this giant, obviously evil artifact that we think was probably the cause of this whole mess, take it down to the planet below, and just kind of put it back where we found it. <laughs> Boom. That is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to get out. So a disconnect in unity of purpose, disconnect in the want, caused a disconnect in unity of action, right? What actually happened? Well, Isaac went ahead and said, oh, yep. What did I want to say? I wanted to say this. Nine times out of ten, problems with unity of action are really problems with unity of purpose. So that being the case, let's talk about how we establish unity of purpose. And this takes us back to our definition of character, someone who wants something badly. Now, as this suggests, there are two components to unity of purpose. What do we want? And why do we care? And this last part is critical. It's not enough just to get the player on board with the character's want. You have to get the player to want it badly. You have to make them care. And this is where we talk about creating empathy in games. This is where we talk about the feels. Making the player and the character share feelings. Now, for my money, there is no better example in games of establishing unity of purpose than the opening minutes of this game. So, let's take a look at the first minute and 13 seconds and see what they do. Is anybody here not clear on the want? <laughs> anybody here not on board with the want? Right? This is a great example. And by the way, in that minute and 13 seconds, they spend like the first 20 seconds on that quote, which does nothing. So how do they pull this off, right? How do they create this degree of unity? Well, the first thing they do, we start on the inside of the train. And what are we, as the player, thinking in that moment? We're thinking, what is this? What's happening here? Right? And then we cut to Nate. And what's the very first thing that he says? What's going on? That's exactly what we're thinking. Right? So we're sharing thoughts. We don't know where he is. He doesn't know either. We are in the same boat together. 
And this is a technique that I like to call sharing is caring. <laughs> this is the easiest way to create empathy, right? By sharing something between player and character, right? It can be a thought, having the character say what it is uh, that the player is thinking. It can be a mystery or a secret, right? This is the princess bride moment. I am not left-handed, right? We knew that, so we have a shared moment. Shared emotion. Make them feel what the, character, uh, what, the, what the character is feeling, right? If it's possible in your game, depending on the type of game, shared choices. Or it's a moment where it feels like the player is turning to you and saying, eh, I don't know, what do you think? And maybe my favorite way to get players and characters sharing in games is this. Shared experiences. Because interactivity, experientiality, that's the art of games. In film, we say show, don't tell. In games, we say do, don't show. And you can use gameplay to create empathy. Heavy Rain does a fantastic job of this, right? Your want in this game, Ethan's want, I should say, is to save his children. What does he do to get what he wants? Well, that's what the game's about, right? You get to decide how far he'll go. Will you crawl through broken glass? Will you chop off your own finger? Will you pull the trigger on another human being? Well, none of those questions mean anything if you don't want to save his children badly. So they have to get you on board with that. And how do they do that? They let you play with his kids. You play Ethan's love for his children. And that's what makes you care. All right, back to Uncharted. The next trick that they use after sharing a thought, right? Nate realizes that he's been shot. He looks down, he's covered in his own blood, right? That's my blood. That's a lot of my blood. What does this do? Well, it makes him an underdog. And the thing about underdogs is that everybody loves an underdog, right? So what does this do? It's a trick to make him likable. And it's another great way to get people to be on board with your character, to care about them, to engage with them, make them likable. Let them be an underdog. Let them be funny. Let them be like someone who makes them laugh. Let them be noble. Let them be admirable. Make them sympathetic, someone that we feel for, not just feel with. Because the more that the player likes the character, the more that they want to be partners with them. So let's walk through the rest of that opening, right? Next thing that happens, at the same time that Nate does, we realize the train is hanging on its side. And in that moment, bam, something falls on top of us. Another shared emotion, surprise. Then he falls down the back of the train, right? He slams into the rail as he falls. Ow! That looks painful. Oops. Right? Sympathy. Poor boy. That hurt. And then my favorite bit, he's hanging off the bottom of the train. I don't know if you could hear this on the audio, but what does he do hanging on the bottom of the train? He laughs. He laughs and he says, ha ha, crap. Right? And this is all the above. First of all, it's likability, because he's funny. And second off, it's a shared joke. Because he's thinking, I can't believe this, at the same time that we're thinking, can you believe that? So boom, we're there. We're thinking what he's thinking. And then we finally get to his want. What is his want? To not die. <laughs> that's a pretty easy one to grok as these things go. And that's another great trick and another great take home when it comes to establishing unity of purpose. Keep it simple. If the player can't understand the want, then the player is not going to share the want. Plus, as a bonus, the more basic, the more elemental the want, the less time you have to spend establishing it, the less you run into exposition overload. Survive, avenge, escape, avoid, acquire. These are all very elemental wants. Very easy for people to get. So that's unity of purpose. Establish what they want. Establish why we care. And by and large, you've built unity of purpose. So that's what I got as far as things to talk about. I hope I have managed to convince you all to hate this guy as much as I do. Any questions?
Our microphone's up at the front. Yeah. Hi, um, I, it's more of an opinion on your part, but um, okay. going through my head while you've been explaining all this, uh, I've been trying to figure out how the original Bioshock's character, Jack, kind of fits into it, because there just seems to be a lot of pros and cons for that character that you've talked about, but just your opinion on him. Um, he's not my favorite silent character, um, but I think he works pretty well. It's a little... They have a kind of kludgy excuse for why he never responds, um, but you don't know that for a huge chunk of the game. Um, and so I think you kind of have to put your, yeah, it's a silent protagonist, I'll roll with it, hat on. Um, and then you get that surprise later on, which is, oh, wait, hang on, this is not, you know, this is, this is actually intentional. So he works, he works all right, but I think there are moments where you definitely have that disconnect of, like, why am I just standing here not having any kind of agency in this conversation? Yep. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Hi. Um, I kind of have a similar qu uh, question to what he stated, but it's about another Naughty Dog game, The Last of Us. Mm -hmm. um, without you know, conveying any spoilers, I think that's a pretty bit good example of a uh, change in the unity of purpose with what the player thinks. Um, I'm just wondering if, because it's something so ingrained in what the character would do, if that makes it okay, in your opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, I think that even when the actions in that game are not what the player would do, I think that you look at them and you say, yeah, but that's totally something the character would do. Um, and I, I mean, I've, I've spoken to people who have said in so many words, like, I really didn't want to do it, but I couldn't begrudge, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that works. Mm -hmm. Right. Regarding establishing unity of purpose, mm -hmm. like um, we all know that how like uh, different things about games affect different people in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like a friend of mine, like I personally liked Gone Home, but a friend of mine thought, called it a walking simulator. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there like any like golden rule of making it, making the casting a net wide enough, or is it just something that's just stumbling in the dark? I mean, I think that's a decision that you need to make project to project is, is are you going to try to appeal, are you going to try to be all things to all people? Um, I think from the way that I phrased that <laughs> answer, I think you can tell what my opinion on that is, which is that it's madness. Um, you know, I think Gone Home in particular, I think, was going to run into problems from people who, it's an expectation management problem. People who went in expecting a conventional video game are going to be disappointed. Um, you know, and that's true with anything. You know, if you have huge expectations for something and you come in and it completely subverts them, that's often a very disappointing experience. Um, you know, so I think that's a, that's a unique and interesting edge case. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you get, get someone on board with the want, right, if they want what the character wants, then they're going to be invested. That's fundamentally what it all comes down to. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us some more characters you loved, dramas, TVs, or anything, games? Uh, for, well, certainly Walter White, um, I think, from Breaking Bad is one of the most, I, I will freely admit that I maybe felt like I identified with him a little more than I'm comfortable with. <laughs> um, um, but he's, I mean, he's a great example. One of the things, especially in linear media, it's harder to apply to games, but it's not untrue in games, right? One of the things that makes characters really interesting is when you have maximum contrast between their characterization and the actions that they take, right? So you look at someone like Walter White, he's characterized as a meek chemistry teacher. What does he want? He wants success or money, depending on how you argue it. What does he do? He becomes a meth kingpin and runs a crushing drug empire. Meek chemistry teacher, crushing drug empire. That's an interesting character. And it's consistent. It makes sense, right? You know, you see that in uh, uh, characterization in uh, uh, GLaDOS is actually another great example, right? One of the reasons GLaDOS works so well, especially early on. I mean, everybody knows that GLaDOS is a homicidal lunatic now, right? But when you first start playing that game, she's cold, she's clinical, she's robotic, right? She comes across characteri uh, characterized as a machine, as something, a logical being of science, right? And it takes a while, and about the time she starts to try to set you on fire, when you realize, no, this is actually a passive-aggressive murder machine, right? That's what makes her such an interesting character. So, 
you know, those are the things that I look for when I'm creating characters and when I'm looking for what media I'm going to consume. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about sidekicks and other side characters. Uh -huh. Sometimes you you have all unit of action and trait and everything with your main character, but sometimes when he is interacting with other NPCs and other characters, sometimes can the the main character like another NPC that the player hates, like uh -huh. that kind of uh, mascot that is really annoying, but the, the main character really likes. That can help to break the any kind of unity. Yeah, that is. I would argue that's a problem uh, in terms of what your sidekick does. When it comes to what do they do to get what they want, if what they do to get what they want, even inadvertently, is annoy the crap out of everyone around them, I would consider that a poor choice on the designer's part. Okay, thank you. So it's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, my question is mostly regarding uh, multiplayer games or cooperative games. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to take the example of Journey, which, mm -hmm. in my opinion, uh, works with the uh, hero's journey in in a very interesting way, because usually the first time you're playing, you're like the hero, so you don't know what to do, and then you find a mentor around, which is the other player, and after you finish the game and play a game, you become the mentor. So in the gameplay, they found a way, an amazing way, in my opinion, to kind of close that cycle and make you feel uh, that journey. And I mean, in, the, in this case, it was a brilliant solution for that kind of gameplay. It matches very well, but I was wondering of other types of cooperative gameplays, how do you do to make uh, all the characters seem and look uh, as important as, as, I don't know, the hero? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, one of my favorite examples of establishing character through gameplay is also the Left 4 Dead games, right? And they do that through the enemy design because there are multiple types of enemies that you cannot defeat on your own, right? The, the ones who pull you away from the group. My favorite, what are they called, the Belchers? Right, where they, uh, they vomit on you and you go blind and all of the zombies in the area come running towards you, right? that mechanic would be unconscionable in a single player game. Right? But because you are dependent on other people to survive, right, it creates an emotional connection between you as, as characters, right? or between you as players, I guess. I mean, that's a game where trait is pretty minimal in that game, right? But want and purpose, those two things, I think you create a, a great degree of unity. If I'm not working with these people, I'm going to die. Therefore, what do I do? I work with these people. Right. All right. Thank you. So, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so it's typical to say in TV or movies that a character has a fatal flaw. And for a lot of it, because they're outside, you're not, you're not their avatar, you know, you can watch them do horrible things and you can root for the difference between what someone wants and what they need. Can you speak a little bit to how character flaws work in video games? Character flaws are tricky in video games. They're easiest in cinematic games like Uncharted, right? And that's, you know, Drake pulls off a perfect arc in that, uh, in that perspective. Um, but they're easiest because you can script it. When you're dealing with flaws with characters in video games, because the player, to some extent, is getting to choose what they do, you know, the, the, the question with a fatal flaw is always, do I succumb to my flaw or do I overcome my flaw, right? And that becomes a choice for the player to make in most games that try to deal with that. Now, there's one way you can do that. You can do that explicitly, right, which is pretty much what Fable 2 does, right? When all is said and done, you have a choice. Do you save the dog or do you save, uh, or do you, do you take the money? Right? That's a question to ask. Who are you and what's really important to you? What are you going to do? But they make that explicit. In lots of games, that stuff becomes implicit. And when it's implicit, this choice between whether I'm going to shoot someone in the face or not, right? a lot of times it passes unnoticed by the players. There's no question there. You know? And that to me is a problem. So I think fatal flaws can work, but they're tricky. Um, and you need to make sure that the player understands the choice that they're making. You know, you need to make that a dramatic moment for the player and not let that be something that's thrown away uh, in, the, in the heat of combat. Um, do we have time for one more question? Yes. Yes. All right. So um, one of the major things about the unity of purpose I've noticed was one game that I played, The Legend of Dragoon, one of the main character had 
a purpose, a unity of purpose, and I could relate to this purpose because despite it being a very, I don't want to say evil, but very, like, vengeful, because he want, basically the main character wanted to avenge the death of his parents by killing the very thing that did this mm-hmm. action. And despite it being a very heinous act on my part, like something I wouldn't normally do or anything like that, but I could relate to it and understand that. What my question is, later on down the road, the character gets to the point of finding out who this character is, and it turns out it's someone that has been close to him and has been like a friend to him, if not one of his closest friends of all time. The one Is it a good thing to ch- change the unity of uh, purpose because the unity of action would prevent him from accomplishing the original unity of purpose? Um, well, what you're talking about is changing his want. Yes. Right. So you've got unity of purpose, the two of you are together, and all of a sudden he jumps to the left. Right? The question is whether or not you move with him. Right? If you stay behind, that's what, that was the dead space problem. Was yeah. that all of a sudden Isaac wanted to go down to the planet, and I was still like, no, call the Marines for crying out loud. Like, I'm an engineer. I'm not going to fix this. Right? So the question is whether or not you can make that leap with them. If you can, then it's perfectly fine to all of a sudden say, you know what, this is what we wanted all along, but oh my God, I want this other thing more now, and so that's what we're going to do. Right? That's a, that's a very classic uh, you know, character arc, is the whole time I was going after A, but it turns out what I really needed was B. Um, so as long as you can keep unity of purpose in that jump, then that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do with a, with a character. Or the other thing to do, of course, right, is to leave it up to the player whether or not we're going to change our purpose. Right? What are we going to do about that? My friend betrayed me. I could shoot them in the face or not. What do you do? So that's the other way to handle that kind of thing. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the show.